Hey guys, Cliff Dennis with Weld.com coming back at you today. Frank and Bob had a little cast iron video here not too long ago that went over pretty well. We had a lot of responses and we had a lot of people asking questions about different casts and different type of repairs. Guess what? I play with old iron. I weld a lot on cast iron, old iron breaks. So today we're gonna to talk about the different kinds of casts. We're gonna talk about various cast repairs and why all repairs aren't created equally. So we're gonna dive into this. I've got an old international engine block there that's split, which is kind of common if you left water in them. And uh, we're gonna fix this block so this block can go back into my old tractor. All right, guys, so basically, I'm ready to start evaluating this, this crack, this break, so I can get an idea of exactly how I wanna go about repairing this. So I think there's a couple conversations that you need to have, and there's a few questions that you've gotta have answered really before you tackle an extensive cast iron repair like this. Three conversations, three topics. You gotta talk about carbon. Carbon is is a huge part of cast iron there's a whole lot of carbon in cast iron and that's going to affect the weld and all other kinds of variables that are going to take place during the repair you've got to talk about residual stresses those welds are going to apply residual stresses to that to that cast iron and you have to first understand the grades or the types of cast irons to associate your project to identify exactly what you've got. So what am I dealing with today? Well, I'm dealing with a gray cast iron repair. How do I know that? A big contributing factor to identifying which cast you have is kind of a casting date game. Uh, good ductile cast irons kind of came later in the 50s into the 60s and we're using a lot of high strength critical applications for block castings, for intricate machinable castings. Gray iron is super common and it's readily available. So there's a whole bunch of carbon in gray cast iron. Why is that important? Well, carbon is incredibly hard. If you need to harden a piece of steel, you're diffusing carbon um, on a microstructure level, when we talk about hydrogen and carbon diffusion, that, that steel absorbing and diffusing that, the same is gonna happen with cast iron, kind of on steroids. So you've gotta understand what carbon is physically doing and what's happening with that carbon within the iron during the welding process. So what physically happens to that carbon as it's being welded? Well, it's being diffused. The, the molten weld puddle is losing or it's gaining carbon depending on the temperature and what phase you are in that, in that cycle. Why? Well, you need to identify the carbon so you can identify proper filler metals. You're gonna have to add metal or physically welding this, what kind of filler metal do we want to use on cast iron? Well, we need to take carbon into the consideration. In a perfect world, we would use a cast iron filler metal. Guess what? I don't have a giant oven to throw this cast iron into. I think a uniform heat is going to help a pure cast repair and I don't have that luxury at the moment. I want to debunk a few things right now. So what happens when you use a mild carbon steel wire or a filler metal on a piece of cast iron? Just like a high strength steel application, when steel is exposed to carbon while it's molten, it's, it's sucking in that cast iron, it's pulling those carbon molecules into the iron and it's hardening the iron. So what happens when you take a mild steel and you weld on cast iron with it? 
Well, there's an interweld zone where weld metal meets base metal, and you're you're basically carburizing that layer of weld. What is that doing? It's making that layer of weld incredibly hard. Yes, it might work. Yes, it may look like it held, but that microstructure, that iron, that steel, where it's mixing, that steel is getting incredibly hard. And that's a big deal. I wanna talk about stainless steel now. So I've heard and I've seen and it's appeared to work in certain circumstances. I've seen people use a, use a stainless steel variation in a filler metal, whether that be a 316 or a 309. I think a 309 is a little bit more common to attempt to repair cast iron. Why am I personally not gonna choose 309? Well, the same things are gonna happen to stainless steel as carbon steel. The minute I strike an arc and I create that heat and that that transition temperature gets to temperature and carbon starts diffusing, that stainless steel is picking up all that carbon that's sitting there in that cast iron. What's in stainless steel that helps make it stainless? A whole bunch of chromium. So what happens when carbon starts to diffuse with chromium? It makes an alloy called chromium carbide and that's incredibly hard. I need you guys to recognize what I'm trying to get at here is that those sub weld layer zones where weld metal is meeting cast iron get incredibly hard when you use mild steel, carbon steel, and stainless steel because of the carbon floating in cast iron. Why does hard weld metal make a difference? Well, guess what? When you apply weld to anything, the the cooling effect that weld has, the contraction as that weld is solidifying is creating stress. It's a residual stress applied to the face or the, the interstructure of that weld and it's constantly putting pressure on a weld zone. I, I keep driving home something is hard because when things are hard, they tend to be brittle. What happens when residual stress is applied to that mix? Man, things start cracking. If you've ever tried to repair cast iron, you know how easily that stuff cracks. You're not doing yourself any favors by helping it crack, by adding filler metals that just are gonna help it get harder and making cracking easier. So that's a big reason why I am gonna match a filler metal with a cast iron. And I'm gonna throw a term at you I want you to remember. I'm gonna throw something at you called ductility. Ductility is basically the ability for, for something to stretch or give or move without failing. The more ductile something is, the more it can move. And guess what? That's really important in a cast iron repair. This cast acts as one unit. This engine block gets cyclically heated. It gets turned on, I start it up, it gets hot, I'm done with it, it cools off and it contracts. It gets hot, it contracts. And that happens hundreds of times, thousands of times throughout the life of the engine. What filler metal did I settle on? I actually settled on an aluminum bronze. Guys, I found this online poking around on YouTube a couple years ago. I saw a couple videos where guys were using it. I tried it out myself and I completely fell in love with it. Um, I'm running this uh, on an AC TIG. This is gonna be my filler rod and I'm a fan of it. I'm a fan of the AC action. I'm a fan that that helps clean the oxides out of that weld puddle. And I'm a fan of the fact that this has a relatively low melt temperature. We're looking at that 18, 1900 degree window versus a nickel alloy. If I'm running a nickel alloy with a TIG or I'm shielded metal arc welding a nickel based welding rod, I'm in that 26, 2800 degree range. So I can minimize my heat input by using this aluminum bronze. 
And when we start talking about expansion and contraction, we talk about that carbon diffusion. This non-ferrous alloy is going to prevent carbon diffusion into my weld and the relatively low melting temperature of this and the TIG braze is going to reduce my heat input into the cast in a literal sense, which again helps everyone and everything, all the residual stresses, keeping the temperatures to a minimum when you're welding, I think is a great thing when you're welding cast iron. Here we are with a little bit older Miller Tick Runner I've got I'm going to use for today's welding. 120 amps, nothing too fancy here. Running a straight AC, no pulse. I'm not jacking my frequencies way up. I'm keeping everything relatively simple and I'm going to be feathering that pedal just enough to get that aluminum bronze to wet onto the cast. I'm not consuming base metal just using enough amperage to get that to wet so I can progress along with the weld. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm making a point to remove all surface rust. I'm removing the surface rust so I can determine where these cracks stop. I'm trying to find the end of these cracks so I could sink an eighth inch of drill bit into the end of that crack, and that's going to help to keep that crack from radiating out further. That radius that I'm gonna drill into right at the end of that crack is going to give that crack a nice area to terminate. It's gonna distribute the stress and it's not gonna to continue to crack when you start welding on it. What I'm trying to do here is you guys will notice me bouncing around a little bit. I've started the physical welding on this block and you guys will probably notice I'm starting at the end of the crack and I'm welding towards the center of the crack and I'm bouncing around a little bit while I'm doing that. I'm trying to minimize that stress. I'm trying to distribute that heat on that engine block evenly so I don't pile up a bunch of stress in one area and I can kind of equalize everything. I'm coming in here with this weld. I'm throwing it into this groove that I've ground. And you guys will notice me slow down a little bit here. And I'm doing that for a reason. Cast iron by nature is cast. It's porous. Sometimes you're going to find pockets of junk. You're going to run over things. And it's not always going to be perfectly clean in every scenario at all times. Working that arc back across back and forth across your puddle of aluminum bronze, letting that puddle wet in to the cast without physically melting base cast is kind of the name of the game here. You're letting that puddle kind of expel junk. You're letting it out gas. Sometimes you're going to run across things that are going to make that puddle dance a little bit. And that's kind of just the nature of the beast here. Go slow, take your time, Make sure you're giving it plenty of filler and you've really got to work that puddle across your groove, into your groove. It does take quite a bit of physical manipulation. I think the big thing that I want to convey here is that it is going to take a little bit of time and it is going to take a little bit of effort to manipulate that arc across the puddle and to wet that aluminum bronze onto the cast. There are going to be impurities and imperfections to this because of the nature of cast iron and that's all going to be okay in the end. If you guys notice some porosity, if you notice some lack of fusions because sometimes things happen, go ahead, stop. Get that grinder out, clean it up, pick back up where you left off, and continue on. There's not an exact science here. Cast iron gets dirty. It's gross. It's oil impregnated sometimes. And there's not always a perfect scenario and perfect situation. If you got to stop and grab that grinder and clean out some junk while you're in the welding process, don't feel bad about doing that at all. It's going to help you in the end and in the end it's going to put more weld metal against cast iron 
which equals more strength, which is what we're going for here. We're trying to make a sound, solid repair. Use all the tools you need to at your disposal to make that happen. Okay, so I'm at a point now to where I've completed the welding on the cast iron. I've went ahead and I've started prepping the final weld profile of this cast. I'm grinding these welds down flush. I've started to take these down up here up top. I've left this one on the bottom kind of reinforced to give you some contrast on what I'm doing. Cosmetic appearance here is a little bit of a factor for me personally. I don't want this to be bluntly obvious that there's a whole bunch of weld on this block. So I'm taking the time to grind these welds flush. I can grind these welds flush because I took the time at the beginning in my material prep. I ground those cracks out. I put a nice wide bevel angle in, into those cracks. So I had plenty of surface area for that aluminum bronze to bind to. So me taking the reinforcement off the top of those welds doesn't scare me that much because I know I've got a whole bunch of meat down in the root of that joint throughout that weld mitt and I know I'm going to have enough strength there. So hey, basically I wanted to give you a video, I wanted to give you some information, I wanted to give you a couple tools to put in your toolbox that you can reference when you guys are trying to tackle these repairs. Is every repair going to be the same? No. Is every repair going to be perfect? No. You guys are going to probably struggle. And while you struggle and while things don't go right, you're learning. And that's, and that's what's important here. You're learning about what works or you're learning about what doesn't work through trial and error. I've welded a lot of cast iron. I welded more cast iron than I care to admit. But hey, I got good at it and I got good at it because I was bad at it. So take this stuff, it's up for interpretation. Use the information to, to help better you and to help your next repair maybe go a little smoother. Guys, I'm Cliff Dennis, uh, coming at you today from the Delta Schoolcraft Intermediate School District in Escanaba, Michigan. I always appreciate you guys following me. I always appreciate you tuning in and listening to what I got to say. Please follow and like weld.com hop on our forum, ask questions, and engage in conversation. All conversations are good. Keep things positive. I hope to see you on the next one. Until then, thanks guys.